Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our May 4th edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson, and I am joined here by Ken Kavula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Good to be with you. And today, as always, we are going to just kick around some topics of potential interest. Certainly, they're of interest to Ken and myself, and hopefully they there are some lessons and some places and things that we can go and do that will be of interest or note for many of you out there. I'm going to do a quick update on Ken versus Mark in the run for the roses, uh, our embedded banks that have been doing pretty well. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about upsides versus downsides and perhaps a little bit of time talking about uh, the Berkshire Hathaway. I refer to it as a quipathon. Um, uh, you know, my opinion is it's probably not quite as enlightening as it used to be. Those guys are getting a little bit tired, and they did pick on uh, average investors quite a bit. Now, I know there aren't any average investors here, but they basically made it sound like it was impossible for the average person out there to uh, to select a stock, and I think Ken and I would kind of like to, well, let's say, discuss and debate that. Would you agree, Ken? I, I definitely agree, Mark. I, <laughs> I think that with a little bit of discipline and a little bit of, of elbow grease that uh, that most folks can do as well as an index fund and and in many cases actually beat that index. So, yep. All right, so we will uh, we'll probably close with uh, one of our favorite adult beverages and a toast to Cinco de Mayo. You know, it's one of our favorite uh, celebrations during the year, and uh, we want to wish everybody out there a happy Cinco de Mayo Eve. All right, a new holiday. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not new in the Robertson house. <laughs> All right, let's get the traditional. Disclaimer out of the way, no investment recommendation is intended. This is entirely about education, illustration, and demonstration. We are basically trying to take the lessons learned and made available by the Modern Investment Club movement as perpetuated by the National Association of Investors, now known as Better Investing, or as we have interpreted it here at Manifest Investing, well, it's it's a team effort. We're all better together, and uh, we're all just trying to learn, discover opportunity, and share ideas. That's that's what we do. As we do that, we will express our opinions. We do try to remember to disclose if we have a personal stake or if we know someone who has a significant stake in anything that we talk about. We do a monthly webcast known as the Roundtable coming up on its 11th year. Um those are always on the almost most often on the last Thursday of every month. Last Tuesday of every month. I keep trying to switch them to Thursday. Uh, <laughs> in my head, only in my head, everybody out there. Um, last Tuesday of every month at eight thirty Eastern time. And now that we know that Ken is paying attention, um, it's a good thing. No, if you want a reminder, you know, an email reminder of that event and other educational stuff that we do. Please send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you'd like copies of these slides or if you have follow-up questions or if you have suggestions for things for us to talk about in the future, mark r at manifestinvesting.com. You can tell where our audience is coming from, Mark. Uh, in response to your uh, best wishes for Cinco de Mayo, we had no fewer than five of the folks in the audience uh, make the quote, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> they, we have a, a certain bent to uh, a lot of folks in the audience as far as where they're looking. You bet. You bet. It, it's, a, it's, it's a combination holiday between the fourth and the fifth. Uh, some of that goes back to our days spent in California many, almost 20 years ago now, almost 30 years ago now, I guess. Wow. That's, that once again is aging me. All right, here's our standing uh, agenda, basically the bullpen, which represents the queue of topics that we would like to talk about in the future, and we will. But today we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about Wobegon and Warren Buffett and some of the comments from this weekend about average investors, uh, some updates on uh, our run for the roses and best small companies. Those two actually run together, no pun intended. I'm going to spend a little bit of time focusing in on the upside-downside ratio 
for a few minutes, and then we will move on to some of those other topics in, in future weeks. Again, you're invited to, uh, to nudge us in the right direction. And uh, you can see that our friendly bull is decked out in uh, his blanket of roses after this weekend. Any comments or questions, Ken? No, I think I'm right with you, Mark. So let's see what we have in the slide deck today. All right, just going back to one of our favorite traditional and regularly featured graphs at Manifest, where we take a look at the value line arithmetic average, that's the green bars versus the left-hand x-axis. And uh, they've been on quite a tear for the last nine months, actually the last little over a year, uh, going from the, the bottom side there and uh, advancing quite handsomely for many of us from this point down here up to where we're at now. Uh, so rapidly and with such a strong surge that we are significantly above that long-term blue trend line, which is nothing more than our uh, Excel uh, regression, exponential regression through those uh, stock market data points. The red dot points are basically a form of forecast given to us by value line. It's what they call their value line meeting appreciation projection, what Mark Holbert calls the VL map. And just wanted to make the point that we are at uh, relative lows, which simply means the stock prices are outstripping their fundamentals again, um, meaning that return forecasts in general are on average lower than most times in history. That 25% actually cranks out to about 5.8% annualized. Of course, the opposite condition was just a little over a year ago, as you can see with that point up at the top, up here, when we had one of the higher return forecast collections following the incidents and events of, you know, March 2020. So, anything you would like to add to that, Ken? Just to Mark, is that 2017 low dot at the same uh, level as where we are now, or are we at a like a, a, a graph time uh, all time low here? We we are tied for that all time low. That is actually at the the same point, uh, a 25 percent. So uh, 2017 point was 25 percent as well. Okay. Yeah, and we kind of eased into that one, and we didn't ease into this one. It was quite a rapid uh, progression. But yeah, it just simply means that it's a little tougher to find stuff on sale. I don't know about you, Ken, but I, I am still finding uh, it can be a little bit harder to look, but they're still out there. There are opportunities out there. I My, my clubs haven't had any problem spending money, so that uh, that tells me that there's there's still opportunity if you're willing to, to put a little bit of homework in on it. So uh, I'm, I'm amazed that we haven't had very much difficulty spending money in the last couple months. But yeah. We haven't, and we'll talk about it here in a few minutes. The list of companies that comes up on our screen for today, um, you could just tell that there's there is a wealth of opportunities out there. All right, well now we weren't going to do this every week, but Ken's name is still on here, so we want to give him airtime at number twenty three in the top forty. But I also we don't have a new sheriff, but we do want to lock in this milestone point it's like being at the quarter pole for the kentucky derby we're at the 25 percent point and to ken and all of his clubs that are on here we just want to remind that it's not a sprint it's a marathon <laughs> we still got nine months to go nancy king is still in the lead and she's actually uh, pulled ahead a little bit of ty and uh some of the others you know they are both from maryland so um, maybe we want to figure out what's in the water in Maryland these days. But uh, like David Einhorn has a chance to jump in the, to the top three also, doesn't he? Yeah, he's been floating around there. He's having his best year in a very long time, and we'll see how that goes. But you see the, the groups that are involved. Most of those are investment clubs in the bold, and there's a pretty good representation of clubs on the list as well as some of the rhinos that are that are shown there and again a number of uh, very familiar names within the community and uh, quite a few that have been near the top in other years and are among the all-time leaders so again we just celebrate the fact that at one fourth of the way to the finish line uh, it'll be interesting to see what this looks like uh, three months from now and six months from now and of course nine months from now all right um, we didn't typically see uh, 
generally 55 or 60 percent of the participants beating the market so that gives a a little bit of a suggestion that we might be doing some fence busting this year collectively and then as we were talking in the green room nothing against kathy and arc but they are their style of investing is definitely uh not uh, in favor right now and she would be 140th amongst the groundhogs right now all right any other comments or questions ken do you want to bask anymore or no i feel real good so let's move on <laughs> any, any cousins or, or other relatives on this list that we should know about all right i'm trying not to say too much because i know how fast these lists change so. <laughs> that's that's true speaking of how fast and uh, how fast things can change um i had been obliterating ken in the run for the roses uh, he chose first financial and i chose great southern bank corp back in july 2020 and if you think back to that time frame, there were all kinds of banks showing up, uh, Western Alliance and and uh, just a whole bunch of banks showing up back then. And, and Ken kept picking them and I kept, you know, accusing him of being stodgy and willing to settle for average, you know, blah returns. And uh, uh, this these are not blah returns, Ken. I agree. And uh, I wish that I would have chosen my other horse for this contest here because western alliance which i own quite a bit of in different uh, portfolios is uh, actually with a relative return up in the 40s right now well, so as, uh, as we'll see on the next slide ken you did insist on that being in the best small company so yes i did yep. hanging right in there but yeah i was uh he, he you know ken has been consuming some of my dust for several months here and uh now uh now he actually pulled ahead so I wouldn't say anybody's losing, though. These are two pretty good horses for the last uh, six months. I I have noticed, Mark, a real dichotomy, though, between uh, banks that are are uh, putting up numbers that are, are just good numbers compared to the banks that are putting up numbers that are, are really outstanding numbers. And uh, I draw attention uh, for the banks to that one number, which... Uh, I'm I'm just sold on it because it's been so profitable for me, and that's that return on assets number, return on average assets number. Uh, both of these banks that we're looking at here have a really great return on average assets uh, up in the 1.25 or above. And when you find a bank that's moving up in that rarefied atmosphere, or even up to 1.3 or 1.4. Uh, and when you can see it happening for three or four years in a row, uh, we hope the most recent three or four years in a row, uh, that's a good place to put your money if the uh, SSG is still saying bye uh, at that point. And uh, my clubs have benefited greatly from First Financial and from Western Alliance Bank. Uh, they've been stalwarts of a couple of the different portfolios. Uh, here it is in the... Uh, Best small companies portfolio. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Uh, in the most recent year since we started this uh, in November 1st, that's 131% relative return. Can't, can't do much worse than that one, can you? Yeah, and I, I have to, I guess I'd have to do a public confession and beg for forgiveness for, you know, saying the word stodgy or boring because, uh, I wouldn't be bored by that type of return in anything that I invest in. Yeah. Well, there's another bank up in the top three up there, the Eagle. Yeah, and uh, eBooks, of course, is banking related. So, well, eBooks is banking related, but eBooks also got caught up in the Reddit crowd. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, eBooks has been a very complicated story, and I would put a big. Well, we're using an asterisk to mean ones that aren't in value line on this uh, list here, but. I put some kind of a reminder that if you are really serious about eBex, you have to do a pretty deep dive because there's a lot of uh, odd things going on with uh, eBex right now. Yeah, and I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them, including Bank of the Internet, now known as Axos Financial, up at the right. top. So, I mean, if this parade ever stops, this our list could be uh, could see some world of hurt. Hopefully any weakness in the financial sector will roll over into strength in the healthcare sector because 
Um, and I have to confess, I was uh, a champion of many of these down at the bottom, um, including Emergent Biosolutions, which is a, a COVID situation that they have not been behaving very well. Now, I'm down to only one or two nasty newspaper articles a day from Lynn Douglas about how these guys are screwing up Johnson & Johnson. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I hope that they will be okay in the long term and that... Uh, the J&J pipeline improves um, with respect to getting the, the vaccines out properly. But, um, yeah, many of these were were, were my selections. Well, they, I do notice, you know, Mark, that my other big uh, push uh, so far has been working fairly well, and that would be home builders and things associated with home builders. So there'd be three on this list, uh, MI Homes, LGI Homes, and Essent. Essent is private mortgage insurance, uh, but they're all to the green, and uh, that's a, a pretty decent thing if you're measuring just since November. Uh, I'll, I would, would take a 42% relative return any day for any stock in a six-month time period. So that's where we are right now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Six months. So. We're halfway in, and that's the, one of the reasons we want to put up this up here. And also just to ma underscore this note of, of, you know, during that entire three to six month period, when those banks kept showing up at the top of the list, we would we would notice that they were there and we would give the warning that, you know, there may be a little bit of optimism here, but these look pretty good, even if you do discount some of the optimism. And that is what has uh, kind of come to pass. And uh, the the sum of this all, these are our 20 companies for the, the year, are, we're running at 47%. Uh, that's actual total return versus 30% for the market. So we are, we're doing okay. We were substantially more ahead at one point a couple months ago, but uh, we still have to be happy with that, Ken, no matter, no matter how I, you take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, Malibu boats. Uh, I would, would urge anybody to take a look at, at, Malibu boats and also Polaris. Uh, I I'm just kind of thinking there's a lot of money in people's pockets uh, in, in a large segment of the population. That doesn't mean it's uniform throughout the country. That doesn't mean that there aren't people that are having issues right now. But uh, there's a lot of people with money in their pockets, and uh, I'm I'm looking seriously at Malibu boats, Polaris, and a couple of other. Uh, of these companies that sell toys, um, adult toys. Yeah, and, toys are uh, good. And, and questioning whether or not those might be good investments for the next uh, couple of years. You know. Yeah, I would think some of those at the bottom, I'm looking at ACM Research, could be a good study now. They're in the realm of chip stuff, uh, electronic chips, and um, that could be an interesting thing to look at. And uh, Intelligent systems probably isn't too bad. I'm enamored with the the trend or theme of e-health. Um, prefer to see it be doing a little bit better, but over the long term, I think e-health as a an investing theme, it's the type of theme that Ken and I will be talking about next week, um, is definitely worthy of attention too. So some of these at the bottom might actually be good studies now. All right. And another really big, big notation, however, we're going to note them that uh, besides eBix having a lot of uh, problems that you don't normally think about a company having, same thing, Emergent Biosolutions is going through a lot of that same uh, issue, not only with uh, stock price and everything, but with their leadership and, and uh, the way they're dealing with, with some of the problems that, that either they've been involved with and didn't create, or they've been involved with and did create. And that's a that's another issue you have to sit and try to think through. But uh, those two companies are, are probably ones you really want to do a deep dive in before you, you put any money behind them. Yeah, and it, in terms of studying the situation with the emergent, uh, I think it'd be fascinating just to notice and learn from. Um, I'm of the impression that this is one or two facilities at the heart of the problem. And I, I got to believe that's a small fraction. I have not attempted to figure it out, but it could be a good study. You know, how 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 much harm can one bad apple or or two bad apples do to a barrel of apples? And uh, I think that's what you're seeing there. So, 
depending on how those are, apples are dealt with, that could also be uh, an opportunity at some point for a patient long-term investor. Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a couple of, of tales that I'm going to tell in our class next week about uh, uh, theme investing, but uh, I can think of some very blue chip uh, companies that in my investing career have been cut in half uh, within the spate of three or four days because of, of rumor or innuendo. Uh, I can think of a company called Sarah Lee, uh, which has uh, since been split up and then bought up and all kinds of things. And, and also a company called Procter & Gamble, where uh, I lost half my investment in, a, in the uh, space of one week uh, when there were some things happening that didn't sound uh, completely right to the general public. So uh, it, it will shave the, the price of a stock. And this isn't a new, a new phenomenon. It won't, it'll happen again and again and again. So. Okay. So again, at the bottom of the list might be um, where some of the loathing and I've been using a word to describe some of the price activity for some of my stocks sullied can sullied. Um, I might come up with a sullied index at some point. So stay tuned. All right, just kind of moving along into some of the other themes from this weekend. Uh, again, the, the show was kind of fascinating. It took place in Los Angeles. It was basically a Zoom approach to what is normally 40 or 50,000 investors descending upon Omaha. And uh, no real big surprises in general. I, I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched some of the highlights. Um, I do find it kind of fascinating that these guys are picking on Robin Hood specifically. Um, I understand where they're coming from, but I do wonder if some of the stuff about uh, the average investors and Robin Hood isn't slightly overblown. But uh, if it if it is a pathway to getting younger people more and in, interested in investing, there could be a really decent outcome there. So, any any highlights from the weekend or lowlights that uh, come to mind for you, Ken? I I must say, Mark, that, that I, I found it a little bit troubling to, to watch both these uh, people that I respect a whole lot, to watch them on stage and uh, to listen to them uh, just uh, disregard uh, a couple of things that, you know, or uh, as Buffett said, he was going to just kind of ignore and dance around a question that he he found that politicians did it all the time, so he was going to do it as well. But uh, I, I would would rather that that uh, Munger in particular didn't try to give me so many uh, quips that could be quotable and, and talk a little bit more about why he felt the way he feels about some things. Uh, uh, I, I especially was taken aback about his comment about cryptocurrency uh, being the uh, contrary to the interests of civilization, uh, you know, that's a that's a pretty strong, pretty strong statement. I'd I'd like to to I'd like to hear a discussion about some of these things. Uh, I, I'm afraid that I I will confess that I I still share some of the concern that that they have about some of these things, but I'd like to hear pros and cons uh, uh, in the before just dismissing it as as frivolous. Mm -hmm. Well, within the next few weeks, maybe it'll take a couple months, we will take a look at that book on cryptocurrencies. I do think Charlie was picking specifically on Bitcoin and some of the some of the more nefarious uses of Bitcoin. Um, that's one specific cryptocurrency. Um, I, I don't know if I told you or not, Ken, I did bring my Ethereum experiment to an end. Um, did, you, did you sell it at a profit, Mark? I noticed I it went up about ten percent yesterday. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it went up quite a bit after I sold, but I just got kind of tired of holding it through the weekend, and <laughs> I'm, you know, becoming this day trader mentality now. No, I, 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 had, I had put five thousand in it and made a thousand dollars in a week, um, which is pretty unusual. Um, I, I think I have. Uh, an understanding of what you know what is driving some of these uh younger people in the cryptocurrency i saw this morning that dogecoin was back up around 60 cents which is a huge advance from where it was a couple weeks ago so uh yeah they're, they're 
there's legitimate concerns about some of this stuff becoming uh, more of a lottery and more more about gambling. But well, I have my own index, Mark, and my son has never been particularly interested in investing or anything else. But he took time out from work uh, about five or six days ago to call me. Uh, and to ask me to put forty dollars of his money into Dogecoin, <laughs> uh, and at that point uh, we had a a one-sided discussion about how I wasn't going to invest in any of these things. I I didn't want to get involved with them on my taxes or anything like that at the moment, and that he could go do his own investing in Dogecoin. But that's my my kind of uh, when you read on the front page of the magazine that that something's happening, that might be the time to be a contrarian about it. Well, uh, when when Nathan is calling and telling you to invest in Dogecoin, that might be a contrarian also. So. Well, I, I have had family members make similar phone calls, and uh, it, it is a, it's an interesting indicator. You know, having said that and done some of the homework with people like Nick DiVirgilio and others that are on the call, um, I do think the Ethereum, is, is, I mean, it basically is blockchain. So there, there is a more of a, a commerce and a utility aspect to it than some of the other stuff. Like, I don't get Dogecoin at all. But uh, anyhow, let's go ahead and talk about average investors that are, that are not here, because we are not average investors that are gathered here. We, uh, we tend to believe as a community that it's pretty easy to do, not, not easy, it's possible to do quite well as an investor and that's that's what this quote is about here um i i think i i share some of your uh aspersions ken that some of the stuff was was too negative and in my opinion a little more evasive than i've ever seen um at this particular setting um especially the discussion about the investing in the airline stocks which they they totally screwed up um but yeah i we have a lot of faith in the, the ability of average people people on the street to figure this stuff out with without uh, an extraordinary amount of effort and uh i do i i just take take a kind of interesting an interesting perspective on it well i i wish that that buffett would have said that that before you become an investor in individual stocks or in in etfs or in in directed mutual funds and things like that that you learn a little bit uh, and that he didn't try to characterize it as, quote, average, unquote, whatever that average uh, comes down to. Mm -hmm. I, I think I know what he was speaking to. I think he was talking about people that have no investing experience of any kind. I think that's the people he was trying to speak to, but I don't think that's the, what, the, what the general population heard when, when you read a quote like this. Yeah, and in, in fact, let's go ahead and talk about, well, we're going to dig deeper into one of those 80-year-old tools known as the upside-downside ratio uh, here in a minute. But uh, I, I basically, Charlie came back at him and, and said, yeah, you know, the S&P 500 is okay for, for most people. He personally prefers Berkshire because he does understand it. But uh, Charlie actually took the, the edge off of it a little bit and, and said that you can learn to select better companies. And in fact, the way that he put it, Ken, was there's a lot of average and less than average companies in the S&P 500. Why do I have to own those? You know, why can I not uh, either using individual stocks or ETFs try to find people who know what they're doing, emulate what they're doing, and try to invest more in excellent companies? And what I basically put together here was uh, I think this is what Charlie's talking about. If you take a look at the S&P 500, it's a, it's a collection of very high quality companies, but there are some real dogs in there. And uh, the performance of the S&P 500 over these many years is shown right here, 14.6. That's basically about a, a 10 year number. And um, just want to balance that off against uh, the Motley Fool 100. Now, The Motley Fool, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, from Fool.com, David and Tom Gardner, and their legions of investors, they invest very much like we do, uh, basically trying to identify excellent companies and buy them when they're on sale. So this particular mutual fund is limited to the 100 uh, best companies in their coverage universe, and just want to point out that it has tacked on several percentage points. 
that is possible. Not guaranteed, past performance is no guarantee, but what you see down here is the top 25 companies in the S&P 500. And again, what Charlie says, do I have to own the average companies? Well, my definition of average would be, you know, some of the companies with the lower growth rates, stuff like that. You're gonna find companies like that in here. We talked about NVIDIA in the green room showing up on that list. And then contrast that with the Motley Fool 100. And what you notice here is, first of all, it's a much bigger bet into some of these, you know, information technology leaders, but I was surprised to see Walmart on this list and not among the top 25 in the S&P 500, unless I missed it. It's not there. Well, the one that I'm really surprised about, Mark, and I don't know if it has to do with with business model or what is, I'm surprised that Visa is not in that top 25 on the S&P. Uh, I don't see Visa anywhere on that top 25. And mm -hmm. I know I didn't, I went through it a couple of times and it's sitting in the top nine or 10 on, on Motley Fool, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. Right here. so it's kind of fascinating to see some of those there. And then you've got these other companies that are in the Motley Fool list like Adobe and Netflix and Nike and, these are some pretty formidable companies. Costco, if you want to talk about clean energy, uh, that NEE happens to be one of the leading energy, uh, green energy companies out there. And uh, I mean, I think this list is more typical of what we would pursue as we try to buy the best of the S&P 500. Um, again, individually or working through you know, an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund. So. I think what Charlie is getting at is you can you can do quite well. You can invest in the best of the best. And uh, I think that's a good message. Berkshire is number seven on this list. So they obviously believe in it. So let's go ahead and talk about one of those tools, Ken. And I know you get excited about this stuff. So I hope hopefully I don't have to tell you off. Um, I do, I do think it's important to, to cut through complexity and embrace simplicity and unleash imagination. And uh, I wanna talk about the upside downside ratio a little bit. On the left, you see a visual analysis from Chipotle back in 2009, followed by a quote that's from one of the members of our audience who posted this on our forum today, um, talking about the opportunity to check up on this new emerging restaurant, Torchies. Maybe we'll get Matt Spielman to give an update on tor Torchies. But uh, you know, basically, investors in our community have, have benefited greatly from both of those companies. And she actually itemizes how well she's done with uh, CMG, Chipotle, over the last a little over 10 years. Um, Long-term investing works when you find a company that begins to take this type of uh, a shape going forward. Your thoughts, Ken? Well, I, I've uh, always uh, thought that, that that's so. And uh, this, this whole concept of, of finding uh, smaller things, I'm sure that when uh, the investment was made in CMG, it was not a giant company. It, it might have been a recent spinoff from McDonald's at that point. Uh, but uh, I, I always am looking for uh, these uh, up straight and parallel lines. If they're only for three or four years for a small company, so be it. Uh, but I, I love to see the, the parallelism like you're seeing on the last three, four uh, data points uh, in this graph right here. Uh, that's what I saw when I bought Cognizant all those years ago. And even though it's gone through some interesting times and then had a couple places where I almost cut and ran, you know, away from it. Uh, it's still been overall one of the biggest home runs I've ever hit. The same thing is true with uh, a number of other companies that, that you hold and you stay on to, uh, uh, you know, my, my Apple holdings and my, my Microsoft holdings all came from, from during times when the graphs were telling me one thing and and the prognosis for the future was telling me something completely different. So yeah, I agree with with uh, what we're looking at here. 
I love to find these small ones uh, and and just ride them. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, I, I've probably said a hundred times in these bull sessions that you don't need to hit that many home runs to really have a great nest egg when you're when you're sitting at retirement age. Yeah, and it can be a fairly established company. If you look at the five selections of Microsoft in the roundtable that go back maybe, I'd say on, on average about eight years, so that $5,000 is now 66000 So that's pretty impressive all by itself. Um, yeah. These things do happen. So what I've actually given, uh, I, I found this kind of interesting. These are screening results. It's a very simple screen. I said I want an excellent quality company so quality greater than 80 and i want an upside downside ratio greater than three so you end up with this list and as i look up and down that list um i i was just i'm going to use the word enchanted you know if, if warren can talk about midnight and mice i i think i can use the word enchanted because I'm seeing, you know, the Regeneron, of course, A2 Milk, which is one that I have featured here fairly recently. But from top to bottom of that list, Massimo, Proto Labs, Kimberly Clark, um, Algonquin Power is one that Pat Donnelly recently mentioned. He also mentioned Houlihan Loki. Um, there are names jumping off this list of stuff that all of us uh, within this community have been kicking around pretty regularly here lately. Any favorites on there for you, Ken? I will, I will say to our audience, if there's anybody out there that has uh, a good, solid, uh, extra uh, information about either Anghaus Systems or Alima Kushtar, uh, either one of those Canadian companies, if you have a report from a Canadian brokerage or, or anything else that can add information to what's available, uh, I'd love to read it. Put it on the manifest uh, uh, forum. I'd love to have access to some more information. Uh, I find Inkhouse especially, uh, the, what I can find is extremely compelling, but what I can find is also very limited as far as information uh, from any kind of uh, outside source. Uh, the companies provided me with uh, some pretty good uh, things to take a look at and and I'm getting a really nice read on what their philosophy is. And uh, of course, I have a, a good eight or 10 years of history for it. Uh, but I'd like to get uh, somebody else's take on it from an outsider's point of view. Uh, those two companies are both Canadian and uh, I'm, I'm having a real tough time finding any, any information. I also really like Houlihan Loki, Mark. Uh, uh, it was a new company when I started taking a look at it about three months ago, uh, and I certainly think that it's something that, that at some point is going to come to the round table or going to come to one of our stock panels, and, and uh, it will be a very interesting addition to our discussions, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, looking on the far right, these are the upside-downside ratios that are above three. The ones up at the top, I know we, we kind of break out in hives anytime we get into double digits up here. All that means is that those stocks are trading fairly close to their 52-week lows. And we'll explain that more in a minute. So it's trading near it's either the 52-week lows or if that shows up on a stock selection guide, it's the company is actually trading near your chosen low price. So um, I do find uh, Clorox kind of interesting. I, I, I need to audit that one. I don't understand how Clorox, with the run it's been on with the pandemic, could be in that situation, but it's it's worth a closer look. All right, so it's a good shopping list, and I, I would be stunned if uh, some of those companies don't show up uh, next week at the at the panel discussion. I, I'll tell you, Mark, I, I exited Proto Labs on, on valuation and haven't really taken a good look at it probably in, in 10 months, a year, maybe longer. Uh, but the fact that it's showing up on this list right now might uh, give me reason to go back and take another look at Proto Labs. I've always liked the concept of the company, and and the management has always proven to be pretty uh, pretty above board and and pretty forward looking. Uh, so that's that's one that I'm jotting down right now just to go back and and uh, kind of uh, re re-examine uh, along with Heartland Express, uh, another 
uh, one that I used to own quite a while ago uh, and exited for valuation purposes. So there's there's two that I'm going to pick up that I used to own that I haven't looked at in, in a while right from this thing. Pretty good shopping list in general. So what Ken and I thought we might do is just spend a little bit of time reinforcing this concept. Uh, those of you that know me well know that uh, I, I don't spend a lot of time on zoning. Um, I prefer to focus in on the return forecast. That's been that way for 20 years for me. But I am uh, every time George Nicholson pulls me back into a moment of simplicity. And, and Ken, stop me if I get off off the rails here. But uh, uh, this is I think of this as a moment of simplicity for if, if you're explaining how we go out there and we find excellent companies, but we are incredibly patient about waiting for them to be quote unquote on sale and this this graphic does it for me what are your thoughts ken well i i this graphic i i think is uh, one of the best graphics that we use in better investment uh it it just is so easy for almost every person that i've ever taught uh to get a handle on uh, you, you talk about uh, setting a high price, and a lot of people get lost in setting a high price, but they do understand that we've set one, and the same thing is true about a low price, but then you go on from that point, and, and suddenly everything becomes crystal clear uh, to almost anybody that you're teaching. Now, once you have this high and low price, uh, you know, divided into four sections, call the top quarter sell, call the bottom quarter buy, call the middle hold, the middle half hold, and then put your current price onto the bar. Uh, and bingo, bango, it tells you, it, it gives you guidance as to what you might consider. And, and on top of that, uh, if you look at the distance above where you made the tick mark uh, for current price and the distance below where you made the distance uh, from the tick mark uh, and do a simple division, uh, actual distance above divided by actual distance below, you have this upside downside number, and it's a it's a compelling value. Uh, the only thing that I told Mark uh, when we were talking about this prior to today's bull session is that uh, it's a kind of a speed bump to get over to get people to to view this as something unique. Uh, this is not odds. Uh, this is not the odds of of making money on a particular stock. Uh, this is just the the amount of potential gain uh, versus the amount of potential loss that you have uh, in the in the stock at that point. Uh, but uh, I agree, Mark. It's elegant, and you and I both understand the use of the word elegant when it comes to math and science. And I, I know a lot of our audience does too. It means that it's it's the easiest way to explain something, uh, and that's the the path of least resistance you should always be taking uh, unless it leads you to to uh, logical conclusions that just don't make any sense. Uh, but uh, this is elegant. This is beautiful. So so we're talking elegant, enchanted. Now we'll add nuance. Um, yeah, we're, we're on a roll here. So what, what, what you're basically looking at here in the, the it, within the scope of the manifest investing database what I had to do is I had to make a, a little bit of a subtle substitution. Uh, for the high price, this is the five-year price forecast for, in this case, Regeneron. And you can see that Ken on his stock selection guide has a slightly higher number. Don't let that give you the heebie-jeebies. They're both, uh, excuse me, uh, this number right here would be the comparable figure, a little over a 1,000. So, uh, again, the fundamental analysis that goes into the sales trend, the profitability trend, and the valuation trend forms this number, and it's continuously changing. The bottom one, I just simply went with the 52-week low. Now, we could have a debate. Maybe that needs to be a multi-year low or whatever, but for the purposes of this discussion today, I needed something simple. And I also just love the notion of, of um, Hugh McManus's efforts to shop near 52 week lows. And that's certainly a picture of one right in front of you. So upside downside ratios are gonna be skewed dramatically as you approach that 52 week low. So those are the two points. And then just simply threw in a couple of uh, 
the buy below point and the sell above point just to, to make the, the overall perspective. But subjecting the entire manifest investing database to that analysis gave us this preceding slide. And again, um, some pretty compelling studies as you as you walk through that list, especially well, Mark, and it, and it all comes together when we uh, listen to any of our beginners programs or even some of our intermediate programs when we make the point constantly when we get finally get to this point on the stock selection guide and we make the point that there's really not a whole lot of difference between a six to one and a ten to one upside downside ratio the arithmetic is such that you don't have to move that green arrow uh, that you have on the price bar there you don't have to move that green arrow very much to to uh, make the upside down side change dramatically especially if you move it towards the low price rather than away from it. Yep, so just be aware of that sensitivity and I, I know that most of you are, are on top of that as, as we go. So there, there we have it. Uh, what I thought we would do is just experiment with a little bit of a poll. If you take the 1700 companies that are in the value line standard edition right now and you look for the median, the middle, upside downside ratio of the 1700 what do you think that is right now and ken can you go ahead and show the poll i think i did mark yeah i can't see it so i have to trust you can you see yours i can see mine we're so, giving uh, giving the audience yeah. five options 0 0.5 0 0.8 one which would be just as much upside as downside two which is uh, and then three which is what we are typically looking for Now, Mark, you should be able to see in your poll box uh, how much has voted, and you're the one that's going to have to close, I think. Yeah, no, I, I can see it too. I don't Never, think I, I can see it. I don't think I have uh, a yeah. poll box. Okay, we have seventy-six uh, percent voting right now. Okay. So uh, we'll give people. We've given them way less than a minute. So, folks, give us a vote. See what 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 do you think the the amount of upside downside companies are uh, here and we've gone to a minute and i'm going to close the poll mark and i'm going to share the results and there's the results from our audience today okay and uh, most of our audience seems to feel that that we're right about in the middle at one to one uh, I will admit that, that when Mark asked me this question blind uh, yesterday, or maybe it was this morning, uh, my guess was around eight tenths. So I'm in the second largest group at 23%. The, we have about a fifth of you saying 0.5. Uh, and then the least chosen number is the three or greater, which would be the buy zone. Uh, and 16% of you at two. So Mark, what is the actual value to this here? Let me see if I can hide this poll now. Okay, and the answer to the, the question is it's actually at the low end. Uh, I'm, I, I see that as a fairly even distribution. The answer is 0.4, which is just uh, an illustration of, you know, how uh, generally overpriced the market is. Now, obviously, there's pockets where things aren't quite as overpriced as others, but um, now, it's we point should four. be seeing a uh, uh, slide either 12 or 14 now, Mark. Am I back now? We're, I'm looking at slide 13, which was just a placeholder. So you want to go one more slide? You didn't have 0.4 on there. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. So it's actually 0 0.4. 0 0.5 is the answer to. Uh, so there's a little bit less upside than some of us imagine apparently right now. Just a, plenty of opportunities, just be careful out there would be my interpretation of that. So Ken, would you like to descri describe our homework for the next few days here as we prepare for next week? Well, a, a week from now at 2 p.m., uh, we're going to open our Successful Investing 3 conference. Uh, we have a real nice registration going on. If you're on our reminder list, then you should have gotten a reminder this morning uh, about registering for the conference. If you're not on our reminder list, you can register at the Manifest website 
If you look in the upper right hand corner under events, you'll see the place to register for one or more of these classes. And if you can't find a place to register, drop me an email and I'll send you a, a sheet which will allow you to register right from that email then. Uh, my email address is kk a v u l a one at comcast.net that's k k a v u l a one at comcast.net on thursday uh at one o'clock we're going to be talking about this from theme to target uh concept we're going to to try to make the point that uh, if you really want to to uh, get yourself involved with a particular investing theme, you need a strategy. It's sort of like writing a term paper in college. Uh, you can't just come up with a big title and expect that you're going to be able to cover it in the, the number of pages you have to, to deal with. Uh, the second class uh, that day will be Portfolio Design and Management, and we're going to talk about tips and tricks for looking at your portfolio. We'll spend a little bit of time on core versus non-core. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, why uh, sales growth is so important to keeping a portfolio vital. Uh, and uh, it's a, a generally uh, uh, giving you some benchmarks uh, on what to watch for as you keep your portfolio moving forward. Uh, Friday, uh, Cy Lynch doing a class called Stacking the Deck in Your Favor. Uh, he'll talk about tips and tricks for the SSG. And in the afternoon, uh, we'll finish with our distinguished stock panel. Uh, Kim Butcher from Florida, Pat Donnelly from the Pittsburgh area. I'll be there. Herb is going to be driving up to his uh, summer home in Traverse City. So we've uh, subbed Herb out uh, for the president of one of Herb's investment clubs. Her name is Charlene Hansen, and I think you'll find Charlene to be a very uh, cool stock picker. So uh, Charlene's going to join us on that panel. Cy Lynch from Atlanta, Hugh McManus from Pasadena, Mark, and Matt Spielman is a new uh, addition to our panel from the Houston area, formerly of Ireland, and before that, formerly of Michigan. So we have our panel ready to go. They're making their picks right now. Uh, here's the picks from our May uh, 2020 session, just about a year ago. They are really doing well. Mark promised to put in the picks from the uh, other panel, but we don't see them yet because his picks aren't doing as well as they should be, I guess. So <laughs> I, need, I need more maybe time. We'll, Maybe we'll get a, a, a capture of those picks before uh, the, the conference next Tuesday, okay? <laughs> and there's that beverage that Kim sent us, uh, compliments of the Florida Keys. Uh, what do you, what do you, what is she drinking down in the Keys there, Mark? I, that doesn't look familiar to me. I'm not sure. We may have, we may have to get a, a field research report on that one. I have to ask her, okay? All I'm right. Feeling it involves rum. So with that, folks, if you want to view any of these things, if you want to view the last uh, couple of roundtables, uh, they are on the Manifest Investing YouTube channel. Uh, we would encourage you to subscribe to the channel. That way, every time that something new is posted on the channel, uh, you'll get a, a, a reminder that it's there. All of our bull sessions are there. And then, of course, uh, the sessions for the COVID Cancellation Conference 1 and the COVID Cancellation Conference 2, uh, Successful Investing, both of them, they're all there as well. Uh, we don't hide anything. Uh, when we make these panel discussions and then make the decisions to put them on the list, uh, they're out there for you to double check and triple check. And uh, if we do well, we like to brag about it. If we don't do well, we we, uh, we, we attempt tell to you learn. anyway. <laughs> we attempt to learn from it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, that's the Manifest Investing YouTube channel. And we'd love for you to, uh, to take a gander at it and subscribe if you get a, a, a chance. Uh, we have some questions here, Mark. So uh, maybe we can uh, take a few of these questions. I'm looking to see if I have any hands in the air. Okay. And I'll Give take this opportunity to wish everybody a happy Cinco de Mayo. 
we have a little more definition on the type of beverage here. Um, don't have that looks like a margarita. Is that a margarita? You think? You, you bet. So we'll okay. wish everybody a happy uh, Cinco de Mayo, and we're gonna we're gonna give Ann Manning a, an opportunity to say something where I hear her hand is in the air. Okay, and you're unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, you should come to Houston for Cinco de Mayo. We have a great time. Uh, okay, I, I wanted to tell everybody something. You were talking in the small companies about home builders, and I don't know if this is going on anywhere else, but in Houston, in Texas, Houston mainly, um, builders are going nuts because there are so many people buying new houses that they're having problems keeping up with building the houses. So much so that there have been builders who've actually told their salespeople, you can only sell so many houses a month Whoa. because they, they can't keep up. And the other problem is the cost of materials is skyrocketing. Yes. I'm very so much they, aware of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they can't price things because they don't know two months from now they could be losing money because the price of materials has gone up so much. So that's just something that, you know, you might want to keep in mind if you're looking at home builders. Uh, it's wow. It's not the worst problems to be having, is it? No, uh, but it is if you're a salesperson when they're telling you you can't sell. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, if you're trying to sell them, it, it causes some issues, but it, it does indicate that this uh, trend might be something that is, uh, has some legs to it. It's not going to, to die off suddenly, you know, uh, uh, as long as we have money that is relatively uh, easy to get, I think people are going to want to try to buy a house with it. So yeah, I mean they're they're having problems coming up with areas to develop here, uh, get to get the lots developed because they're they're selling so many they're selling out of what they have. Yeah. So just thought everybody might want to know that. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann. We'll Appreciate it. Put that on the okay. calendar, Ken. Well, we need to swing by Houston about a year from now. A year from now in Houston. Okay. <laughs> All uh, right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and shut down. Thanks for attending. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, again, happy Cinco de Mayo. Mark Sudip is asking.